Let's get started. So I'm Amber Wewell. Um, it's really great to see so many people joining tonight. I'm really excited. I'm seeing a lot of people that I've been emailing with, but I don't actually uh, know or haven't met in person. So it's it's really fun to see that. Um, <clears throat> the Atlas is starting in January. So um, it's just around the corner. We have been really busy lately trying to finalize lots of details. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot more details involved in the Atlas than I can cover in, you know, 45 minutes or an hour. So tonight I'm just going to try to quickly go over the sort of biggest ideas, the most important things to know about the Atlas. Um, but there, I want to emphasize that there are going to be a lot of resources for you to find more information. We're going to have a website chock full of all sorts of articles, our handbook. Um, uh, can you all try to mute yourselves, please? You're welcome. Would you like to know the biographies of the guests seated to either side of you? Yeah, wait a minute. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to do that, but... All right. Um, so we're, we're planning to do lots of YouTube videos, planning to do lots of live uh, birding walks and all sorts of things um, that will help people kind of figure out how they can participate in the Atlas if the Atlas is new to them. All right, so to get started, uh, just the basics of what a bird Atlas is if, if you're new to Atlasing. Um, a bird Atlas is basically an inventory or a map of bird species um, in a defined space and time. So in the US, Atlases are usually um, done at the state level and they're typically done um, every 20 years and they take about five years to complete. So the, um, and they're done at a really fine scale. That's that's what um, is really important about an atlas. So you can see in this map of Pennsylvania here, it's divided into these really tiny grid cells. These are called blocks. I'm going to talk about blocks a lot tonight. We have almost 5,000 blocks in the state. Each block is a little under three square miles. Blocks are the unit at which we survey for the atlas and the unit at which we monitor the progress of the atlas. Um, and the value of bird atlases is really seen when they're repeated. So that initial atlas kind of sets a baseline and then moving forward, um, subsequent atlases allow us to see where we have species increasing, where we have species decreasing, um, areas of the state or habitats that are doing well or not doing well. And then that information plays into uh, conservation so we can identify at-risk species, important areas that we need to prioritize for conservation, that sort of thing. And then the most fun thing about atlases, they're community science. So this, this uh, monumental effort couldn't be done just by scientists alone. Most of the data, uh, contributed to atlases is collected by community scientists like you all. Um, and of course, in the birding community, we have so many people um, that want to be involved. Um, so we just we have we have great resources. Um, and it's a perfect time to be doing this because we're all so well connected via social media. And it's so fun to see what's going on, you know, across the state, even if you can't go bird everywhere in Pennsylvania, you can see what other people are seeing. So it's really fun. I'm really looking forward to kind of um, joining in that community more and seeing seeing what's going on all over the state and getting across the state as much as possible myself as well. Uh, this idea of using um, just like regular old birders, um, not just formally trained scientists to collect this sort of data, um, kind of came about in the 1960s and this first atlas uh, was published in 1970 in the UK. The idea quickly spread to the US. Vermont was the first state to do a statewide atlas um, with other states quickly following suit and um, including Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania has done two prior atlases. Um, <clears throat> field work done in the 1980s and in the early 2000s. And uh, these sort of first generation atlases tended to just focus on distribution of birds. So just where are birds located? And then um, kind of by the time 
we did our second atlas in Pennsylvania, people started thinking more about how important knowing how many birds there are, um, how important that information is as well. So our second atlas included surveys that helped us get at that question, looking at abundance of birds as well. So talking a little more about um, Pennsylvania's second atlas, the field work was done from 2004 to 2009. We had over 2000 volunteers contribute a million and a half observations and document 190 nesting species across the state. Um, we had a trained survey crew that conducted over 34,000 point counts. So these are those surveys that um, the, from which the data can be used to estimate relative abundance. So we were able to estimate that for 115 species. And most importantly, we were able to collect data in every single one of those blocks. 4,937 blocks. Um, and that's the goal again for the third atlas. I know that if we did it back in the early 2000s, we're able to do it now because we have even more birders now and we have even more um, tools for getting this information out to birders, new birders. All right, the next few slides, I'm just gonna show um, a few examples of the kind of information that we were all able to see from the second atlas. So, and um, if you haven't looked at those uh, two atlas books before, I encourage you, especially the second one, to try to find it at a library or um, from a birding friend and flip through it. You can see these kinds of maps for all the species in there. There's a, um, there's a, a, a species account for each species um, and they're really cool to look at. So here we have two common species of Pennsylvania, Carolina wren and red-bellied woodpecker. Um, and these maps are showing, so every little kind of pixel on the map represents one of those atlas blocks. And if it's colored in, the species was um, recorded as a uh, potential breeder. Um, and if, it, if the square is yellow, it was only detected in the first atlas. If the square is blue, it was only detected in the second atlas. And of course, yellow and blue make green. So if it's green, it was detected in both atlases. And the trend that we see for these two species is, um, is something that we're seeing with a lot of species that have historically been considered more Southern species. So this northward expansion, a lot of factors play into this, but for these two, it's probably largely due to climate change and um, increased use of bird feeders. Um, and, you know, we're undoubtedly going to see this trend continuing uh, in our data from the third atlas. Two more interesting species here. So we have Eastern Meadowlark, which is a beloved grassland species. Um, if you know much about grassland birds, you know. Overall, they're not doing that well. Um, and in particular, in the sort of southeast region of Pennsylvania, you can see more yellow there, which indicates that the species was detected in those places in the first atlas and not in the second atlas. So we probably lost some meadowlarks um, and we probably come up with some good ideas of why that's why that happened. And then Merlin is a really cool one on the right. Um, Merlin was not known as a breeding species in Pennsylvania until <clears throat> I think 2005 or 2006. So it was actually first detected breeding in the state during that second atlas. So during that atlas, there were only a handful of um, nesting records for it. And now 20 years later, we have well over a hundred um, nesting records for the species. Um, and it's really cool to think about, you know, the potential for new species being added um, as breeding species in Pennsylvania during the third atlas. Pennsylvania is home to um, up to 17% of the um, global scarlet tanager population. So we have a really high stewardship responsibility for this species. Um, this top map shows this is what kind of map you get when you just look at that distribution data. So this is again from the second atlas. Um, 
And if you look at this, it looks like, oh, wow, scarlet tanagers are just about everywhere in the state. So that's interesting. But then if you're able to incorporate those point count data, then you can build this, um, you can model that data and build this sort of predictive map that you see here on the bottom. This is a, a kind of a heat map showing where it's darker. That's showing you that, or telling you that there, there are more likely to be more scarlet tanagers there. Um, so you can look at this for a single species like scarlet tanager and come up with some ideas about what kind of habitat or what kind of areas are um, important for good for scarlet tanagers. And then you can start overlaying maps for say um, a group of high elevation forest species or a group of grassland species and really start to kind of circle these areas that look like they're important for these species and start um, prioritizing your conservation efforts in those areas. All right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here um, and get into breeding code. So this is getting into a little bit of nitty gritty. If this information is new to you, don't feel overwhelmed because we're gonna have, again, a lot of avenues for um, kind of educating you on this topic and making sure that everyone knows what they're doing when they're actually out there atlasing. Um, but when we're talking about a breeding atlas, this uh, using these breeding codes and using these breeding codes correctly is uh, really like one of the most important aspects. Um, so when you're just out birding, you're often just walking along and you're keeping your checklist and you hear a species check, see a species check, um, just trying to get as many species as possible. With atlasing, you're doing that a little bit, but also what you're doing, what's really important is taking the time to slow down and watch, really watch individual birds because of course birds are sneaky. Um, they don't like to let us know usually, most species where they're nesting. Um, so in order to determine if a species is breeding in a block that you're atlasing in, you need to kind of watch their behaviors and uh, code those behaviors in eBird. Um, and, and really, um, correctly interpreting those behaviors is, is important. A lot of it is very straightforward. Some of it's a little more nuanced. So we'll be offering a lot of guidelines on like when things get a little trickier. Um, your goal as an atlaser is not really specifically to say, to, to say um, this bird is breeding, this bird is not breeding. Your goal is just to watch for those behaviors and code them and then sort of on the back end with our data review process, that is where we identify what was a breeding record and what was not a breeding record. And of course, these observations um, provide different levels of evidence for breeding. So we'll start at the bottom here with observed. This is um, not breeding evidence. So this is just, you see a bird, it's not in its correct habitat or there's otherwise no, um, no indication that it's breeding. So maybe it's a Canada goose just like foraging in a field. When you're when you're e-birding out there for the atlas, you can go ahead and record that. You should go ahead and record that, but that is not um, that is not a piece of information that will sort of contribute to the atlas. That's just an observation. You don't have to do anything particular for these birds. Um, you just don't include a breeding code. Um, they just go into your checklist. These other three confirm probable possible. This is where we get into using the breeding codes. Um, so possible is of course the lowest level of evidence of breeding. So this is really basic. Um, there are only two codes that go into this one. Either a bird is in the correct habitat or a singing male or a singing bird, excuse me. Um, and then you work your way up to you know increased evidence up to confirmed. So that's, I see a bird, it's clearly breeding here in this block. Um, so that's kind of the gold standard. These happen cumulatively. So um, basically we can upgrade these over the course of the atlas. So for example, say the first year I go out birding, I get, a, um, let's say a worm eating warbler um, singing on a forested slope, um, but that's pretty much all that I see. So I'm gonna code that as a singing bird 
that's going to go into the Atlas data as a possible breeder in that block that I'm birding in. The next year I go back to that location um, during their breeding season. This time I get a, I see a, you know, a pair of worm eating warblers copulating or interacting in some way. I code that in my eBird checklist. Now that has gone into the Atlas data as probable breeders. Um, so as we start the Atlas, we're going to have a lot of species that are in just these observed or possible categories. And our goal is to over time move as many of those species into probable and confirmed categories. All right, so just to kind of discuss this a little bit more, um, New York Breeding Bird Atlas has this really great resource on their website. Uh, the website's down there on the left. If you wanna check this out, this is a very condensed version of it because um, for confirmed and probable, there are a lot more breeding codes than I've shown here, but I wouldn't be able to fit it all on one screen. Um, so again, on the lower right, these are just observed birds at a feeder. You have no way of knowing if these birds are breeding um, in the block that you're in or not. So you cannot associate a breeding code with them. To the left of that, these are those two codes that go with possible singing bird, or inappropriate habitat. And these, these letters at the front, S and H, these are the codes that are in, um, in eBird. If you have ever kind of looked more in depth in an eBird checklist, you've probably seen these at the bottom, but many people have not used them or haven't used very many of them. Um, so we're trying to teach you how to use these. And what's cool about this is that even after the Atlas is over, you can continue using these and contributing um, this information to eBird. Then the middle row, we have probable. So we have, for example, um, a male doing territorial, male red-winged blackbird doing a territorial defense. We have multiple singing males, or we have a pair that are inappropriate habitat. Um, and then at the top, we have confirmed. So a lot of these are really straightforward. Again, there's a lot of nuance for some of these, though, especially when you get, when you're talking about species that, um, like colonial nesters or species that forage really far away from their nest sites, things can get a little bit trickier. So even if you think you have a good understanding of these, um, it's a really good idea to read over the, the material that we will provide for them. All right, so back to atlases a little more generally, um, just for a moment we get the question, why do we even need an atlas? We have um, we have eBird, we have a lot of eBirders. We have um, BBS routes, we have Christmas bird counts. So we have a lot of people contributing their data already. Um, isn't the atlas redundant? And um, so I'd just like to share some reasons why the atlas contributes additional information that those other really great methods uh, don't. So in, in particular, I see the Atlas is really complementary with, um, with BBS routes. So those data can be used together really well. Um, but yeah, so like I said, we have a lot of, a lot of birders and a lot of e-birders in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is actually the um, number five, the fifth ranked state for total number of e-bird checklists submitted. We follow behind um, Texas, Florida, New York, California, so states that have much larger populations and some of them are really like destination birding locations. So it's a it's really amazing that we're like competing with those states for total eBird checklists. But um, that effort is not spread anywhere near evenly across the state. Um, you know, most of our birders are um, in our urban centers so we get a lot of checklists around Pittsburgh and a lot of checklists around Philadelphia and a little bit around State College. But we have um, counties like Greene County that only has 4,000 total eBird checklists submitted. Um, and we this is a, especially an issue um, in northern Pennsylvania, the, sort of the northern third of the state. We don't get a lot of birding activity there. And with just where Pennsylvania is located geographically, we're sort of at the southern range of a lot of like boreal breeding species. Um, so we have species that only breed in that like top tier of counties. We're missing a lot of information for those species. 
Um, we also are biased in when we bird across the year. So we, we bird a lot during spring migration, a little bit less during fall migration and summer and a lot less during winter. Um, so the Atlas really makes a big effort to make sure that we're um, birding across the state and across these different time periods that are really important. That's why we have the state divided up into all those blocks so we can reach a minimum level of effort in all of those areas. Um, and then we'll also be making efforts to kind of bird across species or species groups, including groups that we tend to miss a lot in our checklist. So we'll be doing nocturnal surveys and we'll be looking for marsh birds and all of that good stuff. Um, the second big part of this, why atlases are really important, is because that breeding knowledge is really key. Um, so those breeding codes, like I said, those are in eBird, but they're not used very often. Um, so we're missing a lot of that information. We know that reproductive phenology or the timing of when birds are breeding for some species is shifting with climate change. Um, but it's really hard to kind of describe that without a good amount of breeding data. Um, so the Atlas helps us look at where those, those windows, um, those like breeding windows, you know, where those are shifting. Um, and then breeding, breeding, documented breeding is also really important for conservation. So the way that our um, like conservation legislation works typically is not, um, we don't protect a species because it might be in an area. We protect a species because it's breeding in an area. So knowing where it's breeding and when it's breeding um, is really important. And then the Atlas is also a really great opportunity to monitor rare species. So we have things like, you know, in Pennsylvania, we have bald eagles and osprey that were formerly endangered species. They've now been um, removed from the endangered species list. So they receive a lot less um, monitoring than they did previously, but it's still a really great idea to get our eyes on those things all over the state and make sure that they're, you know, breeding and doing as well as we think they're doing. Okay, so let's get into actually the our upcoming third atlas, the PBA3, um, which as I said, is starting in January. The atlas will be starting with a breeding atlas, um, even though it's January. Um, the breeding atlas essentially goes year round. Um, so when the atlas starts, we'll really only have a couple things breeding, great horned owls and rock pigeons with bald eagles following pretty soon after. And then, you know, things will slowly pick up until we get to like March, April, and then things will really start picking up and it'll get a little crazy probably. Um, so I like that we're starting in January, give us a chance to ease into this, make sure that we all know what we're doing in eBird um, and all of that before where it really gets going. Um, this is of course our Atlas logo, which I'm sure everyone has seen at least a few times by now. Um, I've actually had a couple coordinators from other, um, other state Atlases reach out to me to tell me how cute they think our titmouse is. Um, so I'm really thrilled with that. The titmouse is a really great mascot for, for our Atlas because um, you know it's a common species found all over the state. It's really accessible. You can find it in your backyard at bird feeders and parks. So you don't have to go out into remote um, natural areas in Pennsylvania to find it. Um, males and females look the same. And um, it's another species that has shown um, that northward expansion um, due to climate change, bird feeders, et cetera. Um, so that really like is an example of the kind of information that we get from atlases and why atlases are important. We have a whole list of objectives for the atlas. Um, I've kind of like collapsed them down to these four main ideas here. Um, so starting at the top, again, like I said, we want to uniformly cover the state. So we're going to get to all of those blocks. We want to document all breeding species in the state. And again, we want to get that distribution and abundance data. So we'll be looking at where birds are, and then we'll also be doing those point counts again to look at how many birds are there. Um, and then this last one is um, really more for the people, the birders of Pennsylvania. 
And there's a lot that goes into this. Um, but basically, we want to be really inclusive. So there are a lot of levels at which you can participate in the Atlas. Some of you are going to be really hardcore Atlasers going all over the state, birding a lot. Um, some of you are going to record a few species. Maybe you record one robin nesting in your backyard. We want to make sure that, you know, at either of those ends of the spectrum or anywhere in between, people understand how to participate and feel comfortable participating and feel like their participation um, or the information that they're sharing is contributing to the atlas. Um, and then all along the way, we want to offer opportunities to educate people. This is a really great chance to make sure that people are using eBird, right? Because there's definitely a learning curve with eBird. Even when people have been using it for a long time, they might be doing things incorrectly. So we have a lot of opportunities to work with that here. And then, gosh, there's just so much to learn about birds. You know, I talked about how we slow down and really focus on details with the Atlas. Um, so we don't even have to restrict our education to birds. I love when I'm out birding, you know, noticing, oh, what kind of insect is that bird eating? What kind of tree is that bird perched in? Um, wow, look at this flower on the ground. I've never seen this kind of flower before. What is it? Um, so I hope that we're all kind of in that spirit of learning, enjoying what Pennsylvania has to offer, helping educate other people. All right, so back to talking about blocks again. Um, again, I said blocks are the unit by which we survey and by which we measure our uh, progress for the atlas. And so we set these like minimum targets that we want to reach in a block to designate the block as complete. And that enables us then to move on to a new incomplete block and make sure that we reach all the blocks across the state. We can, of course, go above and beyond um, these targets, and we will in a lot of cases, but this is especially important for the blocks in those underburdened areas of the state to make sure we at least hit these targets. Um, so we're looking for every block to have at least 55 species with breeding codes reported. Um, in a lot of areas of the state, this is going to be a much higher number, probably 95 plus. We will be offering um, more specific guidance on a block by block level of kind of what, um, what number you're looking at there. And then we also will provide, excuse me, for each block we'll have those um, list of species that were reported in the previous two atlases. So you can use those as a guideline also, like how many species are we looking at here in the block? What kind of species should I be looking for in this block? That sort of thing. Of those, species are reported for a block. We want a minimum of 25% of them to end up in that confirmed category, ideally more. Um, we'd prefer this be closer to 50%, but minimum of 25%. We want a max of 25% possible. So possible is that lowest uh, level of evidence of breeding. So we want most of our species to not be in that category. And then whatever is remaining 50% or less will be probable. And again, these, these targets are cumulative um, over the whole duration of the atlas. This is not every year. And um, this is all, any birder who's birding in a block, their efforts uh, go into reaching these targets. Um, so we're also looking at at least 20 hours of daytime birding and at least two hours of nocturnal surveys. I know nocturnal surveys can be maybe a little bit scary for some people. Um, maybe you haven't done it before and don't know exactly how to start. So we'll, again, we'll offer tips on doing that. And I'm hoping personally to buddy up with people that live around me so we can go do some nocturnal surveys together. Um, Cause I don't especially like being out there in the dark myself. Um, and then we're looking at three plus visits in each block and trying to visit all accessible habitat, habitat types. So, you know, one, one aspect of this is like looking at your block maps and trying to see where your different habitat habitats are and planning your different visits um, to those different locations. 
All right, we've been asked a lot about um, signing up for a block. If you don't know what this means, this is basically uh, you sign up for a block as the principal atlaser. And if you do that, you're, um, you're taking responsibility and saying, I will help make sure that this block reaches those targets that I just talked about on the previous slide. You don't have to sign up for a block. This is really geared more toward those people that want to bird a lot and are planning on contributing a lot to the Atlas. Um, if you don't sign up for a block, you can still go bird anywhere, even if a block is signed up for. Uh, you don't have to get any sort of permission or anything, just to clarify this. Um, and nobody owns a block. So even if you sign up for a block, you have, you know, you get out there and bird, but if someone reports a bunch of species before you do, that's fine. Um, we're all working toward this same goal. Um, and signing up for a block also isn't linked to anything in eBird. There's nothing like, it, it really doesn't do anything other than it's fun for birders, um, really fun. And then it also lets us look at our map and see where where our blocks are covered really well and where we have regions where they're not covered well, where we know we need to be like pushing people to go, go to more. Um, so this, this is an example from Maryland, DC. This is the um, Atlas, this is their block tool. Um, we are going to have something really similar. This is an ArcGIS map. You'll just be able to go to this website. Um, it'll be linked to right from our eBird webpage. And it'll probably look pretty similar to this. It's not ready yet. We have um, game commission GIS people working on this. I think it's gonna be really cool though. Um, so basically you're gonna be able to see Pennsylvania with all the blocks. They're gonna be, um, I think grayed out or some other color if they're completed. And then like whatever color if they're incomplete. So if you're looking for a block to sign up for, you click on an incomplete block and you'll be able to see if it has someone signed up for it already or if it's available. If it's available, you click on that and then a like a Google form will pop up and you just have to enter a few things and then um, the block will immediately show as pending. So this will prevent more than one person from signing up for a block. And then it goes through a really quick review process and then pretty soon you should hear that you've you've won the bid or whatever. Um, know that you're the principal atlaser. Um, and you go forth and bird. So this uh, this map will also be where we'll be able to where you'll be able to access your block maps. So if you want to look at maps ahead of time, if you want to print maps, or if you're not um, using mobile eBird, you want to you need to take maps out in the field with you. Um, we'll have some like aerial aerial imagery maps as well as topo maps, and I think these are going to be really nice. Okay, so we have a few new things to look forward to with the third atlas. The first one, which is really, really exciting, is that we have an eBird portal to enter our data through. Um, eBird has been, eBird portals, I should say, have been used by atlases since 2015, starting with Wisconsin. And as they've progressed, they've added a few more features that have made them more and more useful for atlasing. Um, so we're really benefiting from those first few states being guinea pigs. And um, you know some of the benefits of using eBird for the Atlas, it's familiar to a lot of birders. Most of us here probably have eBird on our phone and use it all the time. You know how easy it is to open up. It automatically records your location, your time, your distance. Um, so you won't have to worry about those things. And then when you go on the eBird, our Pennsylvania Bird Atlas website on eBird, you'll be able to see these maps. I'll show some examples in a moment, but it's gonna show like they're updated so quickly that we'll be able to really just keep an eye on how well these blocks are doing, um, which is really going to encourage people to reach those block targets and get out to different incomplete blocks. Um, it's, it's really neat. And then, um, the other thing is that the block boundaries are really clear. I'll show an example of what that looks like as well. Um, 
So the key thing here is that you must use the Pennsylvania Bird Atlas portal. This is um, basically just a label for your checklist. So anything you enter into the portal is still going into regular eBird. You don't have to do anything differently other than just making sure you're entering into the Atlas, into the Atlas portal. Um, and then basically in the end, I, I think of this as a hashtag. So in the end, the data that we on the Atlas reviewing end get, we get all the data that has that Atlas hashtag on it basically. All right, so many of you know that the test version of our Atlas portal is live. Um, we just, this just came live like less than a week ago. Um, so these are really basic instructions. Uh, if you wanna look at it, check it out. Um, if you have an Android phone, you hit the three green lines in the top left. If you have an iPhone, you tap the three buttons and more down at the bottom right. And then from there, it pretty much looks the same. You tap settings. I think in an iPhone, this says settings and account. Then you go down to where it says portal. Yours is probably just in the regular eBird portal. And then you can um, scroll all the way down to Pennsylvania. This has a mistake in the title right now. It says Pennsylvania Breeding Bird Atlas. It should just say Pennsylvania Bird Atlas. We're getting that corrected. So that will change soon. So don't be confused um, if that changes on you. So you hit that and then you go and start a checklist and it will show you that you're in the Atlas portal. Um, and then, okay, so you start your checklist. Your checklist on your phone is gonna look exactly the same as it does now. Um, and then if you you know enter information for a species, you tap on the species and then you scroll on down. And this is where you see on the left side of the screen, you see these are those breeding codes that I was talking about. So the darker the color here, the stronger evidence this is for breeding. Um, so those codes in the really dark purple color, those are the ones that we really wanna be aiming for. Um, and then, like I said, the block boundaries are super clear if you're using mobile eBird. So if you tap on your checklist on the top row or the, the top part of your screen where it said, where it has a little track symbol and it says your, um, your time and distance of travel, you tap on that row and then it will send you to this map. Um, and if you zoomed out on this a little bit, you would see the entire, the boundary of the block that you're in and you'll see your location in the block and your track if you have record track on. And then as you approach a block boundary, your checklist will give you a little alert that says near, near block edge, I think. And then if you actually cross that boundary, then you'll get this alert that says outside of Atlas block. And if you wear a smartwatch and have it connected to your phone or your mobile device, it will actually buzz and tell you as well, which is really cool. Okay, if you don't use um, mobile eBird, you can, um, we'll have paper data sheets. So you can use those. Um, and then you, you know, when you get back home or get to a computer, you just go to this website, eBird.org backslash Atlas PA. And that is where you will enter your data on a computer. It has to be through that um, URL, not just through regular eBird that will not enter into the Atlas. Um, and this website is also going to be our, our homepage, basically. If you want to look ahead, uh, we don't have anything on ours yet, but if you wanna look ahead, you can look at New York or North Carolina or Maryland, um, their Bird Atlas eBird pages and see what kind of information they have on there. It's really amazing, like the, just the amount of information we're able to share. Um, this way. So handbooks, articles, all sorts of things. Um, oh, and I wanted to add, if um, if you don't use eBird or if you don't have um, computer or internet access, um, people are, those people are still going to be able to participate in the Atlas. We will have a method for distributing handbooks and maps and paper data sheets to people. They'll then be mailed back in and be entered into eBird a different way. 
real quick, um, here are a few examples of some of the information that you can then also check out on that um, eBird PA Atlas webpage. Um, these are examples from Maryland because we don't have the, any of this showing up yet for our map. Um, but this, this is Maryland, DC. All of these squares are their blocks. And then you can check out these different metrics um, up at the top where it says Atlas effort, it says diurnal effort hours. You can change that to nocturnal hours, number of checklists, number of species, et cetera. And then you can see which blocks are complete and which blocks are lacking coverage. Um, so that can help, you know, if you're someone who has the ability to travel around the state and go to different areas, this can really easily help you choose where to go put that effort. And it's also just really neat to look at. And then you can um, click on a, an individual block. So here I've clicked on Washington East Northeast. That's the name of the block. And then you can see all of those metrics for the block. And then you can click on view all block data. Each block actually has its own page on um, on eBird, so you can see all of the all the species that have been um, recorded there and everything. You can search by county. So here's Prince George's County. And if you could scroll down here, you would see all 53 of the blocks in the county and all of the um, progress that has been made in those blocks. And then you can also search by species. So here, this is Louisiana water thrush. These squares again are all the blocks. So you can see blocks that it's been, that the species has been reported in. And, um, kind of what, what level it's been reported at. So O is just observed, and then the other pins are, um, those checklists have included breeding codes. So say you really like finding Louisiana water thrushes. Um, so you might get on here and look and see which blocks it has been reported for, but doesn't have a breeding code associated with it. And it's the right time of year to go find breeding Louisiana water thrushes. So you say, oh, hey, there's like three or four, five blocks on here, you know, with the actual location pinpointed. So I could go look for Louisiana water thrushes there. This also kind of just demonstrates how useful um, doing this in eBird is because we have, we have um, you know, these observations are linked to pretty precise locations. Um, and you know, linked to the habitat at that location. So this is really useful for, again, those conservation goals. Um, and this is something I haven't talked about much, but we'll again be offering guidance on this. Um, all these these checklists we're requesting that you keep your checklist kind of short and sweet. So um, we want our traveling distances to be less than one mile. We want the total time of a checklist to be one hour or less. It's even better if it's a half an hour or less. Um, and so that that helps us really link these birds to a precise location and habitat on the map. Okay, the next two things I'm gonna skim over quickly. Um, so we're again doing point counts um, for the Atlas. We'll have a um, trained survey crew that will repeat or try to repeat as much as possible those 34,000 point counts that were done in the last Atlas. But we're also going to have a feature where our volunteer birders can do point counts. This isn't an expectation of all volunteers. This is really geared toward those experienced birders that can more or less identify, you know, all the birds, um, all the species in Pennsylvania. And so we'll have we don't have all of our um, protocols for this nailed down yet, but basically we're looking at doing four point counts in each block. And this is just one time, this is across the Atlas, not every year. Um, but if we can complete this, we'll have an additional 19,000 plus point counts. So that's a lot of extra data that we can use. And then lastly, we are of course doing a winter Atlas. So I said, you know, historically bird atlases have been um, they focused on breeding birds. They're usually called breeding bird atlases. A lot of states are still um, going, keeping up with that tradition, I guess. Um, but a few states have started doing winter atlases. Um, Maine has recent recently completed their atlas that included a winter atlas component. 
in um, North Carolina is in their second, they're, they're heading into their second or third year, I'm not sure, of their atlas and their winter atlasing as well. Um, so of course, winter atlases are important. As I said, we don't bird much in the winter and especially in Pennsylvania, we don't bird much in the Northern portion of the state because it's cold. Um, but if they can do it in Maine, we can do it in Pennsylvania. So this, this map of yellow-bellied sapsucker um, just shows these are eBird reportings um, during winter months for the past few years for yellow-bellied sapsucker. And if you look at this, it looks like most of the sapsuckers are wintering in Pittsburgh and around State College area, and then like to the east and south of there. And we know that that's not true. We just don't have people up in these Northern areas reporting them. So the winter atlas, um, in a lot of ways, it'll be similar to the breeding atlas, but it'll be kind of a toned down version of the methods. It'll be much simpler. Um, so I didn't really talk about with the blocks. The blocks are, um, each group of six blocks is a USGS quadrangle. So a quad has a name. It's named after a, a town or some feature in the quad. And then the quad is divided into six. Each one of those is a block. The way that we name, the way that our blocks are named via eBird now, um, these are different names than we used in the past. They have the quadrangle name. So that might be State College or Amity or um, Slate Run, whatever. And then it has um, these sort of directions after it. So it might be Slate Run Northwest, Slate Run Northeast, Slate Run Center West, Slate Run Center East so on and so forth. So these are repeated across the entire state. Each one of these Southeast blocks is designated as a priority block. Um, so it, these will show up, these will be sort of distinguished in eBird. And then you'll also just be able to tell because it has Southeast in the name. So every single Southeast block is automatically a priority block. This doesn't really matter for breeding atlas. So you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that to start off in January. Um, this comes into play, this will come into play when we start our winter atlas next to December 2024. Winter atlases uh, will take place from December to February, and we will focus primarily on those priority blocks to start. Um, we'll encourage birding in the other blocks as well, but the priority blocks is where we want to make sure we hit our targets. Um, so that period, December to February, will be split in half. So there's an early winter portion and a late winter portion. In each one of those periods, we want three plus visits again over the course of the atlas. Um, we're looking at one hour counts and again, try to visit all the habitats that are accessible in the block. Um, and we, we are still working on the exact protocols for this. So we will offer much more information about this on down the line as we get closer to that time. Um, so, you know, this this is a huge, huge effort. As I said, this is really not possible without having thousands of volunteers helping collect this data. So you all are really the backbone of this project. It would be completely impossible without you. That's really amazing. You should all be really proud of yourselves. Um, and then we have lots of other people helping out. Um, so we have county coordinators and then the state is divided into these eight regions that you see here. And we have one or two regional coordinators in each of these areas. Um, I'm going to primarily be working with the regional coordinators and then the regional coordinators will work with the county coordinators in the, their area to make sure that, you know, we wanna be really clear with our messaging because this is a lot of information, especially for people who are newer birders new, or newer to eBird. Um, so we're trying to work really hard to make sure that our messaging is as clear as possible and that um, we're just really all giving the same information so things aren't confusing. So we're all we're all working toward that goal. Um, and I wanted to add, we're still looking for a co-coordinator for the Southeast region. Um, so if you think you might be a good fit for that volunteer role, or if you know someone who might be, please reach out to me. Um, you should be, you know, comfortable speaking to people familiar with eBird, more or less familiar with your area and a lot of the birders, although we can kind of um, <clears throat> get more familiar with people over time. Um, 
So you can reach out to me for more information about that. All right, so this just kind of sums up the basics of if you wanna participate in the Atlas, how do you participate? Um, if you don't have an eBird account, but you can, um, you have the ability to have an eBird account, go ahead and sign up, um, get familiar with using eBird. Um, and then if you are planning on birding more for the Atlas, please consider signing up for blocks. As I said, this is really helpful for us to see where we have good coverage and where we don't. Um, and then, you know, starting January 1st, go birding. Um, and in the beginning, all the blocks will be incomplete blocks. So go bird wherever your heart desires. But as we progress in the Atlas, if you have the ability to travel and choose where you go birding, um, it's really, really helpful if you can try to focus more on those incomplete blocks. And so come up with your list of target species, species that haven't been reported yet or species that have those lower levels, uh, lower evidence of breeding. Um, so we can upgrade those species. Again, focus on those breeding behaviors. And, um, and then I hope you're up for nocturnal birding. And then finally, record your observations. So make sure that you use the PA Bird Atlas eBird portal. Um, and make sure you're using those breeding codes. If you don't use breeding codes, the data aren't used in the breeding atlas. Um, you can still submit those in the atlas, but they'll sort of bypass our review process for the most part. Um, and then again, keep your checklist short. That's the most uh, useful um, data for us if it's really tied to those specific locations. All right, I just wanna send a shout out to um, all of our partners and funding sources. The bulk of the funding for the Atlas comes from the Game Commission with institutional support from Hawk Mountain. So I am a Hawk Mountain employee and um, and then we're getting you know a lot of support from PSO and the Pennsylvania Audubon Council. And of course, Cornell Lab of Ornithology who has developed the portal for us to use. Um, so if you need to reach me, you can reach me at pabirdatlas at hawkmountain.org. There is that eBird webpage for the Atlas again. We will be getting information on there as soon as eBird lets us. Um, then you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at PA Bird Atlas. We also have um, a channel on Discord if you're using Discord for Pennsylvania birding. And it's under the miscellaneous category, I believe. And if you haven't checked that out yet, but you're on Discord, you should. People are just asking questions and I'm trying to monitor things, but other people are jumping in and like filling people in and answering the questions, which I really appreciate. And um, it's just a really great way to, if you just have like some basic question or whatever, um, you know, lots of people out there wanna share what they know and it's really cool. So looking forward to seeing you all in the field in 2024. Thank you very much, Amber. Appreciate that. Do you have a time for a few questions? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Sorry, that went a little. I tried to keep it short, but I, I don't. It. It's it's tough. Um. Let's see. Let me change the view here so I can. I see. even I took out a few slides today to try to stick to my forty five minutes, but I yeah, failed. I can see. Um. Uh, somebody put the Discord link in there. Um. If you would. Um. Let's see. Um, raise your hand if you have a question. Like there's a little hand symbol. Uh, this was really good, Amber. And I have to look into something. We are recording this. Um, we did expand our license to up to 500, but I'm afraid because I watched the screen only go to 100 that perhaps it didn't work. So mm -hmm. those that did not get in and are listening to this afterwards, I truly apologize there. I'm not sure, but maybe we just had a hundred come in. Um, but we are recording this. So those that did uh, come in, um, please let people know that this was recorded and will be on the DVOC uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, and I can share it on the on our avenues as well. Okay, I will get that to you. 
Yeah, thank do you. We, do we have any questions? I'm not seeing any. I see Debbie, Debbie Beer. Go ahead, Debbie. Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, Barb. Um, my question is this. So I, I know that um, generally hotspots hopefully may all fall into just one block, but um, one of my favorite hotspots is Hog Island Road. And in looking at the maps, the entire length of the road does span two blocks. So I get that I could like, you know, start my checklist uh, and in one block and end it in the at the border and then start another checklist in the next block um, and, and bird. But I, I would be my gut would be, oh, yeah, I'll just pin it to Hog Island Road. But the hotspot pin is in one block and where I physically was was in another block. So can you clarify? It sounds like I should actually then if I'm outside the block where the hot spot pin is, I should not use the hot spot pin. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. Hot spots are really kind of a difficult issue when it comes to Alicing because okay. actually, yeah, I think most most hot spots are going to cross block boundaries, you know, unless it just happens to be a really small spot. Um, so this is a perfect example of when we need to get our messaging right and really get this information out to people. We're request, requesting for the most part that you don't use hotspot names um, or you can, you know, you, you need to, um, when you set your location for your checklist, you need to give it a more specific location. So choose a personal location. You could still include that hotspot name in it, but you need to add something else to it um, because you're, you're exactly right. Um, we need that tied to something that's just specifically in in that one block. So you might give it a more specific trail name or something like that. Um, <clears throat> we'll probably be able to offer a little more guidance or like, you know, more specific examples as we get into the Atlas and see how this actually plays out. But, and you did, you described perfectly what you do. If you want to bird that entire road or path or whatever, and it crosses more than one block, you will, you know, you'll bird for a while, you get to that block boundary. If you're going to continue going on, you need to stop your checklist and start a new checklist on the other side. Right. But the the, the clear point being that I can't pin the second one to the original hotspot, because that's generally how many even, of us bird. No, right? even that first one, you shouldn't, because that whole area, if, if you're not, you know, if you're not, sh if that hotspot name does not indicate a more precise location, then you shouldn't even use that for the first one where, you know, it is in that first block. Oh, I see. Okay. So yeah. it's Hog Island Road, but I should, I should break yeah, it into like, one mile increments. Is yeah, that it? Something like that or um, east, add east, west or north, south to it or something like um, we're going to have to see. This is, this is exactly what I'm saying. We need to figure out our really clear guidance on this. Okay. Yeah, that's that that'll be really key, especially I mean that's gonna be complicated enough for experienced e birders. Mm -hmm. And certainly for new birders are gonna really have to be like, what? <laughs> yeah, and you're gonna you're gonna wanna just yeah. select that hotspot based on habit, right? Because you've done that a hundred times. Because I've been doing that for 20 years, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fifteen years for hotspots. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty-five years for birding. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Um, next, I see Tony has his hand up. Tony Arnold. Uh, yes. Hey, Amber. Just quick question. Um, how will how will outreach work for those who are not using the the breeding atlas, or I'm sorry, the bird atlas portal? For example, I live in in the Gettysburg area. We're getting a lot of pass through people who may not be aware of this. A lot of out of state people, but they may <clears throat> submit promising breeding codes. Will there be any type of coordinator or reviewer duties that maybe people will kind of sift through those to, to reach out? Yeah, we'll definitely be looking for kind of rare, you know, these like priority species that we have. Um, we can't go in and change their checklists to put them into the portal. But if we have any way of contacting those people, we can get a hold of them yeah. and explain, <laughs> hey, can you please switch the portal? This is how you do it. It's really easy. This is why it's important. Um, so that will happen as long as we can contact people. Um, we don't really have any way of reaching out. I don't think to just 
people who are traveling through. Um, it just comes to mind that, for example, when if, if somebody submits a rare bird report, a reviewer may follow up with them for more information. I didn't know if there was a yeah. method. To... Yeah, if, if it's something kind of not noticeable, we're definitely going to follow up on that. If we can't get a hold of that person and it really is an interesting species, we're going to be sending people out to try to get a record for that ourselves as well. Thank you. Um, I didn't see anyone else with their their hand up, but there is a question in the chat that says, is there an issue if people start using the portal before 2024? I don't think so. Um, uh, <laughs> my eBird contact is like on a big trip right now and I haven't heard from him. So I haven't had a chance to ask him this question, um, but I, th I think no nothing will really be used until January 1st. So I don't, it's not going to like contribute to those effort metrics or anything. So I don't think it matters. Okay. Um, another question in the chat is um, if you could explain where do you sign up for a block? We don't have the sign up available yet. Um, that web page is not live. It's going to be this ArcGIS online mapping tool. That is something that we can't host on eBird. So it's going to be on a game commission hosted website, but we will have it linked to on the eBird page. So every you're gonna be able to find everything that you need on eBird. There will be like pages that are about blocks. And then somewhere in there, it will say like, sign up for a block, you know, block, um, Atlas block tool or whatever. So you'll be able to click on those. Those will take you right to that web page. So it's going to be pretty easy to find once it's up. It looks like David Bauman has had his hand up. Um, yeah. Yes, it would help to take me myself off mute. Yeah, um, there was a question that somebody else had that I had. I saw it in the chat way further back. Um, and I think I know the answer to it because it was about uh, settings. Um, when you're setting to in your eBird app to use the to use the portal. That's not something that you have to reset every time then you go to, nope. to use you eBird next time. And you stay you in it. Set it yeah. and forget it is the idea. Yep. Okay. So as long as you're birding in Pennsylvania, you can stay in it, right. in it. If you go outside of Pennsylvania, you need to try to remember to <laughs> change it. But if you forget, um, you can go back and change it later and you'll probably have like a reviewer from Maryland or Florida or whatever contact you if you didn't notice and say hey you submitted this yeah. you know in the wrong portal um so it's it's pretty easy to change those checklists either way you didn't enter it into the atlas portal and you need to change it to that or you accidentally entered it into the portal and you need it to be in a different oh, okay way. you I don't think you can do it in mobile eBird you need to be on the website but you gotcha. do it this way if you're going to edit a checklist like add species or something it's it's one of those options right in that list. It just says change portal. Um, and we'll have clear instructions for that um, on the website as well. Okay, we have uh, Bern with his hand up. Going back to the question about uh, using the portal before um, the first of the year, there are a couple of blocks in the effort uh, map right now that shows effort. People mm. have used the portal and it does show effort. So it is accumulating it right now. And that's why okay. I asked the question. Okay. Oh, I saw that email from you earlier. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to ask about this. Maybe I should just tell people not to use it right now. So um, you, if you have submitted a checklist from it, you can practice if you want going into the, um, no, it's probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can, because this weekend I did accidentally submit a checklist myself from the portal while I was playing around with it. So you can go onto the website and um, see your list and edit it. And then you'll see in that list of things, change portal. So hit that and try to remove it. Um, so I will- um, I, just noticed, and, I, I had just noticed that when I was looking at some of the blocks today, yeah. that there were, three block, there were three blocks that had accumulated data okay. because people I'm, used the portal. I'll try to um, 
I'll try to find out if this is an issue or not <laughs> and offer more clear guidance. So maybe just everyone try to hold off until January 1st, if possible. I know you're excited. Thank you. <laughs> hey, do we have anyone else out there? Ethan, I see you have your hand up. Ethan Kang. Yeah. Okay. Ethan, you, you you will have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can can you... You... So my uh, my block goes in past the state boundaries into Delaware, and there's one park that it's kind of unclear where the border is. So do I submit like multiple lists where I think the Delaware border is, or do I keep on counting birds in Delaware? Uh, you should be able to. Oh, ha... okay. I've only looked at in eBird at blocks in because I can only see the block boundaries so far that are around where I live in State College. Um, so if you're on the border of the state and you're looking and you're in one of those irregular blocks and you're in eBird, can you have you have you looked at it in eBird? Yeah, the square just goes into it, Delaware and it it's extends. just a square. Okay. Um, well, I mean, if you're tracking your route, you should be able to see where you are um, in that map. So that should help. All right. Thank so, you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so if that happens to anyone, if you have record tracking on an eBird, you keep just keep an eye on that map and you should be able to see where you are and make sure that you're not crossing the border. Um, just try your best. Thanks. Harry, if I uh, believe you had a question on sensitive species, if you could uh, unmute yourself and, and ask that question. Okay, so Amber, I believe the question was, what about reporting sensitive species in eBird? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so we have this guidance all like nicely laid out in our handbook as well. Um, there are three species currently in Pennsylvania that are designated as sensitive species in eBird. These are um, American goshawk, black rail, and long-eared owl. So if you report those species, they won't show up in this like public eBird output. Um, so no one else will see their location. We're trying to get a few more species added to that list during their breeding windows um, so that people can feel comfortable reporting those species without any concern of you know birders or photographers flocking to them um, and um, potentially harming those birds or their nesting efforts. Beyond that, beyond those three species or that slightly longer list of species, if we can get those additional ones added, um, we offer basically the same guidance that eBird offers, um, where if you are concerned about a species um, that you've located and you don't want to share that specific information, um, you can hide your checklist until that breeding um, effort or breeding season is over. When you hide your checklist, that is hidden both from public view and from our review. So we won't get that data until you go back in and unhide your checklist. Um, so you do need to make sure that you do that. You may also want, you know, if it is like a rare species that is, you know, pretty important for us to confirm, you may want to go ahead and let your regional coordinator know about it. Um, so we kind of know that it's been recorded for that block. And then like, if you don't have maybe real, doc real well documented evidence of it, we might try to get a photo or get some greater um, support for that. And um, there are a few other kind of tricks to, um, if it's something you're kind of concerned about, but it's not a real sensitive species, um, you know, there are other tricks that you can do to get kind of um, obscure that checklist for a while. 
Um, and if it's anything you're just not sure about at all, contact your regional coordinator. We're specifically asking that you contact a regional and not county coordinator about this issue. Um, because, you know, our number one goal here is to like do nothing that will be harmful to these birds. All right, thank you everyone for joining and please just, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question tonight, feel free to send me an email.